All right, hi everyone. Uh, I'm Nick. I'm a data scientist at Data Camp. I'm here with Ron Pearson. Uh, we just finished recording videos for Ron's new course on data visualization in R, which uh, we're, we're really excited about. Uh, so welcome. Thanks, Nick. <laughs> um, so one of the first questions I always like to ask people is, uh, what do you consider yourself? Are you a statistician? Are you a data analyst, a data scientist, a hacker? <laughs> and why? Okay, well, since my education is electrical engineering, um, I don't consider myself a statistician. I don't have the formal training. Um, I have worked a lot in what has now come to be called data science. I was working in it before it was called data science. Mm -hmm. And so I guess I would consider myself a data scientist. Okay. And what, what does data science mean to you? Uh, data science to me involves a lot of exploratory data analysis. The um, probably the, the primary driving questions are, can you predict something? So building predictive models is a big component of that. And can you understand something? So exploratory analysis, detecting relationships between data or unexpected features in data, I see those as the primary components of data, data science. Yeah, it's an interesting perspective because the things that get all of the attention are uh, the machine learning and uh, now, now recently it seems like every newspaper I pick up is talking about artificial intelligence. Um, but, but, but you're actually positioning data science as a field that's dominated by exploration, by exploratory data analysis. and. <clears throat> I don't think it gets the press that um, uh, those other areas get, yeah. but I think uh, it's often been said that uh, something like 80% of the task of model building is actually vetting the data, getting it prepared, mm -hmm. getting it in shape where you can actually build models with it. So I do think that even though it doesn't get the same amount of press, I think it's a, a critically important part of that. Mm -hmm. And in my own view, it's a very interesting part of that because mm -hmm. you're looking for unusual things and, and it's amazing sometimes what you find in data. Yeah, yeah absolutely. And um, it, it definitely... Uh, like the, 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 the old adage, like garbage in, garbage out. Yes. Right. So if you've got, um, if, if your data is garbage, it doesn't matter how good your predictive model right. is, uh, you're not going to get reliable results. And, um, and likewise, if you're not exploring the data in the right way, you may not be asking the right questions in the first place. Right. Um, so you might get a, a good answer to the wrong question. Right, right. Um, no, so that, that's a great way to think about it. Um, so how were you first exposed to the R language and what is it that uh, that drew you to it? Okay, well I was first exposed to R actually through its commercial near equivalent S+. Uh, I was at the DuPont company at the time and I was involved in building dynamic models and so I was trying to actually construct something called the Martin Thompson Data Cleaner which is a supremely effective data cleaning tool, but incredibly complicated. And I was actually looking at um, translations of Kybernetica to try to figure out what the tuning parameters should be. My boss came in one day and said, I just heard about this S plus package that seems to have what you've been working for months to try to build. And sure enough, there it was. Um, uh, Doug Martin was actually one of the founders of the company that um, uh, that introduced S+, plus, and he was also one of the authors of the Martin Thompson Data Cleaner paper. So it was natural that it was there. Um, I used that, and then I started exploring the other things that were possible within S+, plus, and I became you know, a complete devotee of that. Then, as time went on, I got exposed to R, mm -hmm. um, and the big advantage of R is that it's free. Uh, it's also grown enormously. Um, and so the range of things that are available in R far surpass any other um, platform that I'm aware of. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I've become a real fan of R. That's pretty cool. Um, interesting. So what what areas are you? Um, so I know I know you love exploratory data analysis. Yes. Yes. Like what what do you enjoy? the most? Like what, what areas do you enjoy working in? It could be either specific domains that you're excited about or different parts of the data, data science process. 
Uh, well, I, I guess I would have to say, you've, you've already answered it, the exploratory data analysis aspect of things. So looking for unusual things in data and trying to determine whether those unusual things are influential enough that you need to worry about. So by unusual things, for example, one unusual thing that doesn't get talked about a lot but that I find fascinating are inliers. One definition is that these Wait, are inliers, in as liars, opposed to outliers. As opposed to outliers. Okay. So, one definition of inliers is points that are wrong but consistent with the rest of the data. Unfortunately, that's not a mathematical definition. But one characteristic of that kind of inlier is that often the same value is repeated. And if you look at numerical data, in principle, in continuously distributed data, so if you like the Gaussian distribution ties have zero probability. So if you have a whole bunch of repeated values in the center of a distribution of otherwise relatively uh, untied data, mm -hmm. that is often an indication that there's something very strange going on. Mm -hmm. So it's things like that that I love digging into and finding. That's really interesting. So in other words, we maybe naively assume that um, for, for something to be uh, wrong or strange about the data, that, that it would necessarily be like far from the rest right. of the data yes. points. Yes. But actually, it might be tucked in along all of the normal yes. data points uh, that, should, that should be there, disguised, right. disguised well, maybe. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> in fact, that's one area that I've done a bit of work on. I did a paper on disguised missing data, which mm -hmm. shows up that way. So if you yeah. have values that really are not recorded, but they're recorded with some special value, that may get missed. Mm -hmm. um, so there are, lots of, there are lots of ways that data can, can be flaky, mm -hmm. and uh, that's fascinating to me. Yeah, okay, very nice. So, um, what sorts of trends in the field are exciting to you? Uh, the, the evolution of the machine learning models. Um, if you do comparisons between performance of various different model types in predicting something for the same data set, then historically linear regression models, you know, that was the tool that was available, that was what everybody used. Mm -hmm. Then people started using other tools, but they were sort of harder to use. Now you have a lot of tools like uh, boosted trees, um, random forests, things like that, and all kinds of variations of those things that are much easier to use and that lead you often to very different models, very different kinds of predictions than you could get from more traditional models. And I find that arena exciting, especially with all the different variations of some of these models. Mm -hmm. One of the most intriguing model classes I've seen is the MOB models that are available in the party kit package. So there's a function called LMTree that fits tree-based models where you have a decision tree, but at the node, rather than having a single prediction, mm -hmm. you've got a linear regression model or a generalized linear model. Yep. And some cases, that can give you tremendous both predictions and insight into mm -hmm. what's going on in the data, mm -hmm. in that it's effectively splitting your data set into uh, different partitions that behave very differently. Yeah, that's pretty interesting. I've actually heard Max Kuhn talk about this type of model. It, is it called a model tree? Is that is that the right term? Uh, that's one term. The in um, I've forgotten what the MOB abbreviation stands for, but yeah. the party package uh, was the first place I've seen this. Yeah. And then um, the party kit package is an extension of that okay. that also supports it. But the basic idea of automatically partitioning your data set into subsets with mm -hmm. different models for the different subsets mm -hmm. is an extremely powerful one and these tools that that do that uh, are are I think a great development and something yeah. that uh, I know R supports I don't know of other platforms that support that yeah that's really interesting so maybe with without going too far off the deep end here like the, the, I think the argument that one of the arguments that Max made for this type of model is that um, if you have a tree, when you get out to the extremes of the data, you never predict, make, you never make a p prediction beyond the most extreme value at one of the, the endpoints of the tree. But if you actually have a linear regression at that endpoint, 
it, it might it might give you more accurate predictions when you get that far out in the data because it can actually make predictions beyond uh, right. beyond that one point. Yeah. 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 Well, and another thing that I like about these these structures is that often the uh, resulting models are simpler than uh, if you built, let's say, if you were able to get a regression model that had all kinds of interactions in it, mm -hmm. and then you build one of these regression tree models. The regression tree model may actually have, let's say, three different simpler linear regression models that get pointed to by the tree. Mm -hmm. You may be able to represent that in terms of a linear regression model with complicated interactions, mm -hmm. but it's much easier to explain and to use in the form of the regression tree model mm -hmm. than it is in the regression model with all the complicated interactions. Yeah, that's um, that's also interesting. It seems like um, yeah, so a lot of what, what you read about in the in the papers are kind of these black box models where. You, the, the results that you get are not necessarily interpretable. Right. Um, they might be highly accurate and, and extremely useful in certain contexts, but, but they may not be very interpretable. And in, but in certain domains, interpretability is still very important. Right, yes. For example, public policy, where yes. if you have a, a predictive model that's helping a judge to make decisions <laughs> about whether some, someone should, should, should go to jail. Right, um, right. And, uh, and, and so there's certain contexts where you want to maximize predictive capability, but within the constraint that you need the end result to be explainable right. to the public or whoever yes. the, the key stakeholders are. Um, and it seems like a very exciting field right now. There's a lot of people working on this problem of how do you build highly predictive models in such a way that they can still be interpreted or take traditional black box models, maybe like a random forest, and, and how can you build um, some sort of interface to that that allows you to communicate the results in an explainable way? Right, right. And, and in fact, that's another area where uh, R has some nice and developing tools. Uh, so things like partial dependence plots, uh, can give you an idea of how this black box prediction depends on your different variables that mm -hmm. go into that prediction. Mm -hmm. Even though you're not trying to infer that from uh, coefficients in a very complicated model, mm -hmm. you're looking at it more from an input-output perspective. So is this related to like a variable importance plot? Uh, it's a little different, but it's somewhat along those lines. Okay. Variable importance gives you an idea of, at least the way I look at variable importance, uh, if you eliminated a variable, how much would that hurt your model prediction okay. capability? Mm -hmm. Whereas in this case, uh, if you're looking at uh, something like a linear regression model, <clears throat> then you know that the influence of variable x is this uh, straight line and it's characterized by the slope and the intercept. Mm -hmm. For a random forest model, that's probably not true, but partial dependence plots give you a way of saying, okay, the curve that relates as I change x mm -hmm. that relates to how my prediction varies looks like this. Mm -hmm. And so this is a way of getting, it doesn't give you a complete picture of what the black box is doing, but it gives you important details. Yeah. Similarly, the variable importance uh, measures also give you important details of saying, okay, this decision depends very strongly on these three variables and essentially not at all on those other eight. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of interpreting the results of black box models, that can be very valuable. Mm -hmm. So maybe just to go a little bit deeper on, on one thing that we discussed earlier, like. What do you see the relationship being between exploratory data analysis, as you define it, and predictive modeling and machine learning? Like, is, is there a component to machine learning or predictive modeling that is exploratory? And then, and then the same way in the course that you talk about like explanatory plots, is there some explanatory phase of predictive modeling as well? Is there a, 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 some connection um, there? <clears throat> Well, the connection that I see it is, uh, and, and the way many people approach this, is exploratory data analysis is a preliminary phase that you go through before you build the predictive model mm -hmm. to make sure that you're identifying things that uh, either variables that are 
uh, ridiculously predictive because, in fact, they're derived from your response variable, mm -hmm. uh, so-called postdictors or data leakage, mm -hmm. um, or outliers that are simply so strange that if you include them in even very sophisticated models, they give you horribly biased predictions. So a lot of exploratory data analysis is useful in sort of cleaning up and preparing the data so that you've got a good data set to feed to your uh, predictive modeling uh, mm -hmm. procedure. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, I view it as, as uh, highly, uh, highly important that way. Uh, but there are some interesting um, applications, potential applications, of machine learning uh, tools in exploratory data analysis. So for example, the Baruta package in R uh, is a package that allows you to it builds random forests, and it uh, gives you variable importance from the of each of the variables based on that random forest. But it also includes some uh, fictitious variables that are uh, randomly generated. And so you have a frame of reference to say, OK, these variables are or are not more important than these fictitious variables. Mm. And so that, that can be very useful in deciding um, of all of these 80 variables you've got to look at, which ones are worth uh, <clears throat> investing my effort in trying to understand better if I'm trying to predict this, this variable. Because sure. uh, that's, that's an arena where the exploratory problem I mean, if you've got thousands of variables, you can't explore everything. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Uh, so it's important to, to guide that exploration in order to find those things that you definitely need to know about mm -hmm. in order to build models to accurately predict what it is that you're most interested in. Sure, sure. Another example, I, I suppose, would be like missing data imputation. Yes, right? yes. You have like a bunch of missing data and you actually build a predictive model to predict based on all the other inf information you have what would you expect the value of this missing right, variable right. to be for this particular observation? Uh, a lot's been done with multiple imputation, typically using fairly simple models. Mm. But that's obviously an arena if you're using multiple imputation with random forests and boosted trees and, and deep learning neural networks and so forth. Uh, there ought to be a lot of interesting things that you could do in getting better imputations, mm -hmm. at least in cases where that's a reasonable reasonable strategy. Yeah, yeah. Okay, very good. Um, so anything else that, uh, that you've got on your mind that you want to talk um, about? Well, all kinds of things are rattling around here, but, uh, <laughs> but, but nothing, nothing is uh, really percolating to the surface at this point. All right, well, this has been really good. Yes. Uh, I, I, I learn every, uh, something every time I hang out with Ron, so <laughs> I, hope, I hope you did too. Uh, all right, well, thanks a lot for this. This is great. Yes, yes. Right. Thanks very much. This sure. has been fun to do. Great.